so I'm from Loughborough University, uh, where I used to work with uh, Stella many years ago. So she's asked me to come today to, just to talk really um, about uh, children's reading and how it's being affected by um, digital text. Um, so my interest in children and young people reading um, has come from a PhD I did in the mid-1990s. Um, I'm now a lecturer at Loughborough University and I teach modules on uh, children's literature and librarianship and various publishing modules. Um, but my PhD, when I was looking at electronic books for children, there weren't very many. There was only really CD-ROMs. That was the only thing that we could look at, um, which I did do that, um, and uh, with varying um, degrees of, of success, which I'll mention in a minute. But I think that the importance of reading in childhood, we all know it's very, very important, um, as a love of reading for pleasure, which I think is the most important part of it, but also um, it is a foundation for the acquisition of knowledge. Um, but there's lots of concerns at the moment, which I'm sure you've read in the newspapers, that new technologies are actually competing for children's leisure time. They're not reading as much as they used to. Um, and in fact, there was a study came out a couple of weeks ago which actually found that children <coughs> were embarrassed to carry books in front of their friends, which I find quite depressing, actually. But uh, that was a finding by the National Literacy Trust. So there is a decrease of interest in reading, but there is, I think, a growing appeal of computers and other media for children. Um, there was another um, study, uh, I think just this week, that showed that three- and four-year-olds are actually um, able to access the Internet, use iPads, that kind of thing. Um, so perhaps they're embarrassed to be seen with books, but actually they're not so embarrassed to be seen um, with all this new technology. So what I was actually looking at in my PhD and what I'm still interested in now, um, and it's actually becoming more important, I think, um, is whether books that are presented on computers can actually re-engage children with reading. So if they don't mind being seen with technology, how do they feel about an e-reader? Is that better for them than um, perhaps looking at a book? Um, and the electronic book represents a sort of combination of the advantages of the printed book. We all know how a printed book works, um, and some of those um, issues can come out in electronic books. But also now we can have the interactivity that children like um, within the books um, on computers. So I think it can sort of bridge the gap um, between print and other media. Um, so having said I was looking at CD-ROMs, I was actually quite interested at that time about whether there was a lot of interactivity in those CD-ROMs, whether that was affecting children's comprehension of the stories they were reading, whether they were actually more interested in all the sort of bells and whistles and things you could click on. Um, and a study I did actually sort of showed that actually there was an indication that it was helping children's um, understanding of the story um, by having it electronically. <coughs> and my, my theory was that because um, with the CD-ROM they could see the text being highlighted as it was read aloud to them and there was a little sort of picture at the side which was an animation of the story, they were sort of getting this in three different ways. And I think that sort of aids with uh, different learning styles that children may have. So um, that, was, that was my theory at the time. Um, so what I've done recently is actually look at new e-readers because that was a sort of dry period between my PhD and now. Um, and as soon as the Kindle came out, as we all know, e-readers have, have exploded really. So I now think that those kinds of um, books could be uh, quite useful for children. So I did a sort of small scale study looking at children reading um, Kindles, um, an iPod Touch and a Nintendo DS with... Um, they call them games, but they're called flips, and they're actually books on a Nintendo DS. I don't know if anybody's seen those. Um, very hard to read because the screen is so small, but anyway, we, the children can usually cope with that. So, so we looked um, at that, and the children were all really, really keen on reading the Kindle. There was, the iPad wasn't out at the time. It was just before it came out. Um, so I was really intrigued by this, particularly as one of the children I had um, identified himself as a reluctant reader. Um, it was an eight-year-old boy um, who just said he didn't really like reading, he couldn't choose any favourite books, he just wasn't keen on reading, but he loved the Kindle. And his parents were absolutely thrilled because he asked them if he could read, and he'd never, ever done that before. Um, so that is my sort of new um, question that I'm, I'm interested in looking at, is whether reluctant readers particularly will be keen on, on reading through e-readers. And uh, there's been a sort of very small-scale study that I was reading about in um, Silip Update recently at Sydenham School, uh, where they've given e-books to reluctant readers um, and uh, visually impaired children and uh, dyslexic 
children and they've, they've all sort of responded very well to, to these e-readers. So really what I think about uh, the future of text in terms of children reading on e-readers is that I think it will help children learn and read in different ways. Um, I think it won't change the reading of that many children, so those who like reading in print will also probably like reading um, on e-readers, but I do think that it will help those who perhaps are embarrassed, reluctant, or perhaps need help in terms of being visually impaired or um, suffering with dyslexia. Um, so I think you know, it, it will encourage children to read e-books, it will encourage children to read printed books, um, and I think it's, it's um, going to you know, really help uh, those children who are struggling. There's also the sort of side issue of textbooks. If you can uh, load all your textbooks onto a Kindle, then no longer will you have to carry around, as my children do, huge great bags with full of full of books. And I think this, their school is looking at, into getting iPads for everybody there. Um, so that's all I had to say, really. That's my take on the future of text. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the transition from reading with lots of animations for really young children to more text-based for slightly older children. Does that seem to be at a young age, or how do you feel that's working? Um, well, the, the children that I was looking at uh, with that study were 9 and 10. So, um, yeah, they and at the time, that those were the, the only kind of books that were available, you know, sort of um, only up, up to about that age. And I think Cat in the Hat as well, which was a quite a nice CD-ROM book. Um, yeah, I think, I think it helps reluctant readers because they can't see how long the book is. <laughs> so, and they don't know how far they are through quite often as well. So for some, that's, that's quite good. You know, they, they don't think, oh, we've got all this text to read. So I think, um, as I say, you know, things are changing very quickly and there's more and more books now available for children on, on e-readers. E Sorry, does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Have there been any studies, or have you done any studies in terms of how much it engages their brain and how, how much it um, kind of excites them? I'm thinking before bedtime reading. Um, I, I read a lot to my son before he goes to bed and, and I know that it helps him to calm down, whereas I know when we sit and use the iPad during the day, it's just too much for him and it would yeah. kind of wake him up again. Again, um, I just wondered if there's been any. I, ha I haven't done any research, I'm not aware of any, but I, I agree yeah. with you. I don't, I don't think it's a replacement with small children. Um, for reading, I know some children like like to listen to stories on a tape, don't they? If their parents don't read, no, I think parents reading to children is is the yeah, major. Engaging it is. To, I mean, I yeah, changes, yeah, but. absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Does um, interaction with the screen immerse them in the story, or do you think that it might, um, for example? they become the author themselves? Is this why they like interacting with computers? Uh, yes, I think there's probably an element of that because the interactivity <coughs> allows them to not necessarily read linearly and, yeah, they can they can click on on different things each time they read the story, you know, with, with them. Does that help them with the overall narrative? Do they get to know it better or do they just see it just completely differently? Um, I think probably they see it quite differently, but, that, again, there's, there's not research I've done. Do you think that this type of reading bridges the gap so when they start using more adult computers they're more happy to explore or do you think it doesn't make much of a difference in that? To be honest, I think they're using adult computers when they're quite young anyway. So I think the, the two things probably work, work together. You know, I, if I have a problem with, with a computer, I ask my children. <laughs> I think a lot of people have that experience as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I forgot to do this. That was Sally. <laughs> I forgot to do that. Uh, I'll just switch over. Oh, yeah. Okay. And this is Roger Walsh. <coughs> Come on up. Um, Roger Walsh is head of our public engagement oh, and learning works. team That's at the, the British Library. So if you just got it off the screen for me. There you go. In the conveyance of information via exhibition. <coughs> Great. Uh, thank you, Nora, and uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation to be the only BL person on, on the panel. It's, it's quite an honour and uh, a little bit intimidating as well when I read everybody's um, biographies. Um, oh dear, why is that doing that? Oh. It's on. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is supposed to stop. Oh, 
Yeah, I'm not sure why it's. Uh, we've got a timing thing on it. Can you? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was told to keep it very short, and I've got kind of three little topics I wanted to talk about. One was something which Nora mentioned to me about um, what we do in the galleries. And that got me thinking about actually what do we do in the galleries. Um, the second one is about looking at kind of the long history of, of reading, is what I was focusing on more so than text. And um, obviously, knowing that um, there's plenty of people who are far more knowledgeable, including in, in digital scholarship, on what is the cutting edge of, of kind of technology and e readers and that side of things, I thought I'd, I'd go back in history a little bit. So we look at that. And the other is something actually picking up on what Sally was talking about, about how reading is taught in schools and why we want people to read. So that's, that's roughly it. Um, so, uh, this is um, an artwork by uh, Marcel Duchamp from 1915, um, commonly known as Shovel. And basically what he did was he suspended a shovel from the ceiling and therefore... If he cared to explain what he was doing, which he didn't, but if he did, he might have said by um, preventing the shovel, shovel from being used as a shovel, it becomes a work of art. And in thinking about what Nora was asking us, what we do over in the galleries, in a way what we do is something similar, but unintentionally. We take books, which are there to encode information and to be read, and we put them in cases so that they cannot be read. <coughs> and... And that's an interesting thing to do because we, we, we change the nature of that artifact from something which is a, a tool for communication into a, an object or an artifact or we fetishize it in one way or another. And you can see one page of it or, or two pages of it. So then a good few years ago we decided, well, we need within the galleries at least to give people access to the information that are in the books um, in some way. So we developed the turning the pages technology. And that began as a, a gallery interactive where you could, on a, on a large touch screen, basically like a very big iPad, um, turn the pages and you could have what is closer to the real interaction that a user should have with that, that item. Um, that's a screenshot of it there. Um, it's a really beautiful piece of technology and it um, has since progressed to the web and it's since progressed to iPad. So you can now get the King James Bible or Captain Scott's notebook on your iPad and flick through it as if you're flicking through the real thing. Um, but then I began thinking about, well, actually, in, in doing that, what we were trying to do was completely replicate the, the artifact, the book itself. And we weren't really using the, um, the affordances of the multimedia technology in the way that a multimedia book would do it in terms of being able to interact with it in other ways. And I thought, in a way, what we've done in that transition is something dissimilar what happened at the beginning of printing which was, this is um, one of my favourite items in the collections. It's Caxton's um, uh, Recoil of the History of Troy. It's from 1471, and it is the first book printed in the English language. And it was printed in Bruges or Ghent, not, in, not even in England. Um, and what's interesting about it, I thought, was that um, it's almost indistinguishable from the manuscript version that would have come before. So printers didn't have typefaces or fonts or anything else like that. They basically replicated what was the manuscript hand. And this is the second page of it. Second page of it there. <coughs> um, and that made me think that actually, in a way, when you look at e-readers, certainly Amazon ones and others, and what we are doing in the galleries, is that the, those transitions which take place in terms of presenting information um, to begin with, they usually just repeat in a different media or format what has come before. And it actually takes a very, very, very long time before the, the real understanding and implications and affordances of those technologies get applied. Um, and actually, the, the book is an interesting thing because it hasn't changed <coughs> considerably in 500 years. It, it's extraordinarily, um, extraordinarily effective. Um, and I'm just going to leave that kind of hanging there because these guys hopefully will be, will be able to talk more about what's happening in the transition between um, uh, printed texts and, and e-texts. Um, the second bit I wanted to talk about was um, 
was reading uh, in schools and why, why it's good. And I think there is a, a myth around, or, or certainly an understanding, that young people do not read. Um, one of the reasons given for this is because they spend so much time on social media um, or messaging each other or texting each other, all of which, of course, involves reading and writing. So the point is, actually, young people do far more reading and writing nowadays than, than we did. The thing is, they use it for a different purpose, which is to, to communicate socially. And what they probably do less of is long-term, sustained reading of things like novels. And I think that raises questions for all of us, because there's, there's something culturally about the importance of long-term, sustained reading of narratives, which is viewed as hugely important. Um, actually, in the same exhibition where we had this book on display, we had um, one of the first novels, which is late uh, 17th century. The novel itself is actually a very recent thing. And I think there is a question, a bigger question behind all of this, about whether long-term sustained reading of narratives, which is a relatively recent invention, a few hundred years ago, will continue, or whether it will go the way of opera or classical music and become a, you know, important but niche pursuit. And that people will read in a different way. That they, they won't read novels, but they will be reading for information or reading in, in different ways or multimedia ways or watching films or whatever it might be. Um, another thing that occurred to me then in thinking, <coughs> and, and you can tell this isn't a hugely prepared kind of presentation. It's not an area I focus on, on normally. So all I did was, was just spend some time thinking about it. And it's great to have the opportunity, I think, for all of us in the library to have time to think about these things. Um, was why young people today may have issues with long-term narrative reading. And one is, for me, is certainly how literacy is taught in schools. And if, if any of you have time, I, I suggest you go on um, YouTube and have a look at a Michael Rosen clip um, at the uh, it was a presentation of his at the National Union of Teachers conference in, in Brixton, uh, where he talks about something called extractitis, which is that students are presented from a very, very, very young age, um, not with narratives which are engaging and entertaining and where you see character development and you see story development, you see all the things which are exciting. What they get are small chunks of text, often taken from bigger narratives or summations of bigger narratives, um, and then given comprehension questions on, on that. And if you read how terribly reductive and reductive and boring these things are, you realise why people may not have an appetite for reading. Um, it's also very, very entertaining in terms of how Rosen does it, so I'd recommend having a look at that. Um, and what should I say the last thing I was going to talk about was? Yes, it's about, it, I guess it's about the benefits or the wider benefits that are perceived of, of in terms of the future of reading and, and communication and whether those long-term explorations of, of narrative and engagement with characterization and all the rest um, will remain or whether we will in some way return to a form of reading and writing and texting and communication which is much more socially based. So if you imagine that for thousands of years people communicated about fairly basic things, they told stories but they, they spoke around fires and in a way it struck me that social media and the communication that young people are doing nowadays is, is actually much closer to that than it is to the what may have been a kind of a temporary aberration in terms of the creation of the novel um, and other forms of high culture. That's the end of me. <laughs> Any comments or thoughts? So it was just more of an observation, really. There was a higher education, <coughs> school, sorry, higher education talk in our long ago where they were talking about percentages theses published at the moment which use primarily secondary sources rather than... Yeah. You know, the primary source, which is what we mm. do at the library. Um, and it was, I thought of that when you were talking about the um, extracts from books mm. being stuck into the children's textbooks. Yeah. And perhaps, I mean, this isn't a question, it's more like an observation, perhaps the um, engagement with social media and those abstracts 
from books and mm -hmm. from narratives might actually create a new form of, a, of an oral history or a tradition of an oral history mm -hmm. where our culture is passed down yeah. in reinterpretations by different generations might be quite yeah. interesting, but it could be a way that it goes, the novel is going to die. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a kind of a postmodernist yeah. world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we do an awful lot in the, uh, on the learning side around um, primary sources and secondary sources, digital literacy, information literacy, and that was something else I was thinking about actually when Sally was talking about. It's that you have this issue around, it's an issue, you have literacy with functional literacy, with, um, which is being taught in schools. Um, but there's a much wider question which the library engages with around broader literacies of digital literacy, information literacy, critical thinking, evaluation of sources, for example. And particularly as more information becomes available, the question is whether not just young people, but everybody has the skills to interrogate and understand those primary sources. So when I, when I did history in school, um, you basically read second-hand accounts of the origins of causes of the First World War, it was you know, militarization in Germany, all the usual stuff. Um, nowadays you can read um, diaries, photographs, uh, well, you can, well, you can read a photograph yeah, in the kind of postmodern sense of a text. <laughs> um, you, can, you can interrogate those original sources. Um, you can look at a 16th century, 17th century um, broadside or newspaper report. Um, but even if you have the functional IT skills to find this stuff quite quickly, and even the functional literacy skills to understand all the words. Do you have the intellectual, cultural, social, political framework, intellectual framework, to be able to interrogate and understand those sources? And that's something that we in the, in the library work a lot with on, on students. But, and, and, but I think it applies to all of us in a, an information-rich world. That's a good point. I need to know more about your giant touchscreen that's authentic, turning pages. Is yeah. that something that's changed now? You're working towards a new form of exploring those books? Um, it's, it, it's interesting. It still works very well. Sure. And, and people still really, really enjoy it. And yeah. we've brought in elements. There's more multimedia elements. So you can hear, a, um, if there's music on the page, you can hear what the music is. You can zoom. You can blow things up and all the rest. Um, I guess, again, it was a, a gallery experience because you're standing doing this. It's more like a, turning the pages of an illuminated manuscript or a lectern Bible. Um, now that we have it on iPad, you can sit down and quietly turn the pages and read Shakespeare in the first quarto um, because it was printed and it's legible. Reading manuscripts in that form is a bit tricky. Um, and, of course, it gets much closer to a traditional reading experience as, as we know it in terms of the, the size of a book. Yeah. And what's interesting is that, that that journey from the big thing to the little thing is the same process that has happened with printed books. If you look at the original King James Bible, it weighs five kilograms, and it's about that big, and about that big. It is a, a lectern Bible. Our exhibition on illuminated manuscripts, most of the books were about this big. They're enormous things. Um, and, of course, the book became portable and small over a few hundred years. Um, which is exactly what's happened with technology. So, but to be honest, we are, I, we think there's different digital directions we would go in than trying to recreate exactly the, uh, the kind of the image and feeling and, 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 and experience of, of a printed book. Actually, what we're trying to do now is do something which is more multimedia and multimodal. Now that you've so beautifully put the book in historical context and not made it the big rock that everything should be, uh, what do you see the role of libraries being in the future when a printed copy is only one version, it's not necessarily the mainly read version? I think that's really interesting. Um, I think there's a text and a book is, re is really just a way to encode information and then those who are literate have the tools to decode that information so I guess it doesn't matter too much what form the stuff is encoded in having said that and if I was giving a different talk I might talk about the value of books and the fact that my flat has got books all over the place and I love them and I love the feel of them and all the rest so I think there is something about value in there there's something about it being tangible and, and viewable and 
and browsable in a different way, I think, to multimedia. Um, but in a way, maybe there is something iconic about certain heritage items. It's like the type specimen of in the Natural History Museum or the, 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 you know, the, the meter of platinum in Paris. That when you go and you see the, the manuscript of um, Beowulf and you realise that all of our knowledge of this story comes from this, uh, this original item. Uh, it is quite a, quite a moment. But it, I, I, I think there's actually the digital scholarship guys would be the, the right ones to answer that question, I think, about, about where we go. But I, th I think in a way, format, I guess I'm trying to say in a very convoluted way, is that format becomes less important <coughs> and it is the information contained within it that is the important thing. However, and it's communicated and, and accessible. Thank you. Good. I'll probably run over. Thank you. <laughs> It makes me think of the hashtag long reads, which is always like funny because it's always only just like one page. <laughs> so this is Keith Martin, senior lecturer in publishing at the University of the Arts London, um, and he's also the technical editor of Mac user, so I'm assuming you know how to use that machine yep. very well. Um, and he'll be talking about type and text and yes. Uh, yes. Uh, probably what got some notes here. Uh, yes, I mean, I was going to um, start with uh, something a little different from what I ended up actually putting together. Um, I read recently that um, in Star Wars, in the Star Wars films, um, there's no text. Everyone is effectively, practically illiterate. This is about the only text that appears anywhere in the Star Wars films. Which is a very interesting thing, and somebody's actually written a very interesting blog post about it. You can find it if you just uh, Google illiterate Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Sufficient. Uh, but um, I think ultimately, while it's, it's um, an interesting conversation to sort of take further, really it wasn't meant as that. It was just, uh, it suited the narrative to just focus on droids and holograms and stuff like that. Um, so... I thought I'd talk about something a little different, um, something that uh, not that many people really get that involved in. It's the sort of the obsessive mind of the typographer um, and um, the large number of fonts that are out there and why, what they're for. I mean, I've helped to put together, this is a few years ago now, I helped to put this book together as a collaborative effort. Uh, it really suited me very well. Um, I have a certain sort of affinity with the type and uh, it basically lists a thousand fonts and a little bit of background about each one and um, it just scratched the surface really. There are tens and tens of thousands of different fonts and then new ones being made all the time. Grungy ones, really sophisticated professional ones. Uh, there are just a huge number of fonts out there and all sorts of varieties. Uh, but typographers <coughs> keep making more uh, because of a certain uh, <laughs> personal interest, I'd say. Um, so, I mean, if you think about your font menu, I mean, how many fonts do you think you can put in there? I mean, if you loaded in just a uh, small percentage of the made, uh, available fonts and started scrolling through, you'd be waiting 10, 20 minutes to get to the end, probably. Um, but then we need to start thinking about um, choosing the appropriate fonts, because the type we use actually gives our information, uh, it's an extra channel, it's an extra way of communicating, and you can do it well, <coughs> or you can do it not so well. This is um, an invoice from a funeral home in Comic Sans, <laughs> <laughs> and this is real. It's not what I would like to see. Um, if somebody ever does that for me, I will come back. <laughs> and talk to them. Um, okay, there may be a use for Comic Sans. I haven't found it yet, but there may be a use for it. Um, but uh, fonts are really, it's, it's a way of actually ex expressing emotions, and you need to choose the right ones. And uh, there are different fonts for, that are suitable for different things. You need to just think, okay, what is the message that I'm trying to get across? It's, you need to think about what you're saying, 
you, you've made the words. I'm assuming we're talking about people writing content and then showing it. And then you get to choose if you are the person who actually does the final typesetting in whatever context it is, you get to choose the visual message as well. So make sure it actually fits. Uh, now this one is something that uh, I showed last time I spoke here. Uh, I think it actually underlines things quite well in a slightly different way. We know the top left one, but if we choose a different font, then it becomes different, less effective. Um, a lot of people like this font, but not in this context. <laughs> it would not be safe. Uh, so next time you actually choose a font, think about what it's saying. And also stop and think about the process that goes into making it. Because creating a typeface takes a long, long time. There, are, there is normally a huge array of characters. Even a simple display-only font will probably have around 100 different characters. Um, maybe 70 or 80 minimum. But uh, Every single one of those has to be created carefully, point by point, painstakingly adjusted, tap on that, just tweak the line, and then compared with other characters, run out in different pieces of type, large, small, the actual, uh, the kerning, the particular character pairs, how one letter fits when it's next to a particular other one has to be considered and then adjusted. It is, I would skip back to that word, obsessive, if I could, without jumping through everything, but uh, it is, you have to be slightly obsessive. But it's the way people create the typefaces that we take for granted. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity of picking um, sort of one-off typefaces or ones that have a huge <coughs> set of variations. And uh, this kind of variation gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of sticking with an overall tone of voice but actually being able to pick things out. But then stop and think the work that goes into making all of these different weights and styles part of the same family. So take the work that goes into one and then multiply it. And then each one of those things needs to be compared across. It does take a long time. I've, I've made a few fonts and it takes a very long time. So this is a very, very quick talk really. And um, there's just one last thing that I wanted to say. It's really, I have no answers as such about things. It's more a friendly warning. Uh, type is the clothes that your words wear, so pick your fashion, your attire carefully. Okay. Uh, on that last note there, we just very often people say that type is like the uh, voice, the intonation of mm. the writer. Uh, what about also the hand movements? You know, all of you out there say it's great, you know, you're all animated. That doesn't get captured in type. Can that also be... Well, I mean, this could touch on to the, the difficulty of uh, expressing emotions in emails, the whole invention of smileys and everything. Um, well, if you can choose your type, then you can start to express, or you can start to add layers of meaning to the actual data itself. Uh, you can't then just sort of do that in a piece of type without actually making it quite awkward to then just read through. It's more of an overall impression. So you can't get sort of specific moment type uh, expressions in type very easily, other than maybe uh, just picking out certain words, phrases, sections, and emphasizing them or de-emphasizing them with so bolder or lighter. Uh, these things you have to do carefully, though, because there are conventions in terms of how we actually uh, use different Things. So if this was actually uh, a statement, it would be quite sort of, <coughs> it, would be, it would be very jumpy trying to read that through. If somebody was actually trying to replicate in text the way they might emphasize every few words in what they're saying to try and get that across. You could do it, but you wouldn't want to read a whole chapter in something like that. Well, it might be an interesting exercise to do this with um, the written form of 
a conversation. Listen to the conversation, try and replicate it in styles. Do people create tight fonts so they can't be read? Not, yes. Not yes, there is every single <laughs> kind of type imaginable, including, I mean, I've mentioned grunge fonts. Uh, these are fonts. They're just they're for display. Uh, they're for impact, and you wouldn't really want to set more than a few words in them. Uh, and sometimes the words you set in them you can't read anyway. But they're interesting. It turns into graphics. What's your take on Kindles and, and so forth, allowing users to select their own fonts and sizes? I guess one of the things I really like about books is, the, is how they're set and the, and the font and the kerning and the, and the whole kind of package and that's it. Mm -hmm. But now, and I was speaking to my mum earlier, um, you know, she sets the font, she chooses the size, she changes sizes throughout the day depending on how tired she is. It's taking control away, in a sense, from the designer. Obviously it's fine on certain books, but mm. I guess what's your take on that, really? Uh, well, I stand uncomfortably on both sides of the fence on this. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to prevent somebody from being able to read something in a way they found more comfortable. Sure. Uh, but there are certain things that I would produce that I would want to actually say, no, I want it to look like this. Um, now, if I was doing <coughs> sort of a, a narrative, long-form text, I would be less likely to dictate it. It's more if you want to actually put um, a page structure together as opposed to a text flow. Is that mainly then the difference between a book and a magazine? It's one of the differences. Yes. Well, it's one of the typical anymore. differences from a typical book and a typical magazine. There are so many edge cases to both that they do overlap and go off in, into the hinterlands. But yes, it's, I'd say it is one of the key differences between typical books and typical magazines. Um, I have a long, um, uh, long standing argument with my boss over the virtues of uh, a serif versus sans serif fonts on <laughs> broad screen reading. Um, is it, I mean, I, I personally prefer sans serif fonts for on screen readings because I'm aware that um, my eyesight isn't great. Um, he says it doesn't matter, the, the serif fonts are much more beautiful and there's no evidence that. You know, sans serif fonts are better. Is there any evidence? Is there any research in this area? Uh, there is all sorts of conflicting research. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, there is the uh, sort of the uh, sort of perceived wisdom. Well, the sort of the um, uh, the uh, the sort of 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 the old uh, idea that uh, serif fonts are easier to read, and people have said it's because the serifs link letters together, and we start to see them as word groups. Uh, I've seen other studies that uh, show that people in different professions where, um, I think one example was engineers where the documents uh, and sort of, well, the different forms of text they read happen to be much more common <coughs> than sans serif, they find sans serif more easy to read. Uh, so in that bigger picture thing, what do people find more easy to read? I think it's just what they're used to, which makes sense. Uh, I can't give an absolute answer to that because I haven't done the research. I don't have the time. I'd love to, but uh, I, it makes sense to me. Rather than just saying absolutely, this kind of everyone finds it easier to read. I think it makes sense that it's what you're more used to. Now, in your case, uh, what sort of stuff are you actually reading? Um, well, it can be um, anything from um, uh, an article that I'm trying to edit or proofread on screen to. Um, Okay. Possibly longer pieces, two shorter pieces, blogs, etc. Okay. Um, but I would, if I if I get a piece that is in a serif font, which I prefer, absolutely prefer in print, I I switch it to a sans serif because it's a lot easier for me to. Yeah. There are two two things there. One is uh, you are working on the text. There's no reason to be concerned about the beauty because you need to see it in whatever way you find most clear, because that's not the way it's going to end up. Why should somebody else say, well, I find it easier, or I find it nicer looking when I see it in this font, therefore you have to work in this font. That doesn't make sense. The other thing is, um, until we all have what Apple's calling retina screens, very, very high-resolution screens where we effectively can't see the pixels, uh, fine details in, uh, such as serifs in smaller text size, body text size fonts, um, it can't be rendered that clearly, even with the anti-aliasing smoothing technologies. So yes, it may well be that um, a, in the stuff that looks really beautiful in print will not actually be that clear on screen, so you might as well go for slightly simpler shapes. 
quite afraid. On the question of being on what you're used to, what operating system do you use? I'm going to guess Windows. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so that, I think it has a lot to do with what you're used to. I'm a Mac user, and I think that's horrible. But uh, you know, you kind of compare. There is a difference on the two operating systems. It kind of prints differently. Uh -huh. Visually okay. on the screen, uh, right. there are yeah, and there are different ways of controlling how it looks on Windows. There's clear type, the smoothing technology, but I think ultimately uh, with a standard resolution screen, if you're working at small text sizes, then you may as well go for <coughs> simple shapes because the uh, the details will just get broken up and lost. To, to be if, if I may to be absolutely honest, where if I give a, a conference paper, I do print it out in a sans serif font because. I'm, I'm less likely to lose my place. Yep, it's what you prefer. Makes sense. Uh, this isn't some a question which one would expect an answer from, but it's kind of an, it might be an extended comment. It, um, I wonder what um, novelists, uh, well, writers publishing their work in, in ebook formats think about the control over how it displays that their readers actually have. Because it occurs to me, I mean, that I, the person who speaks to mind is someone like Edward Gill. Who obviously writes a good deal, but 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 is particular, but is also a typographer and a, a, hmm. and, a, and a publisher who has his own bespoke press in, in, the, in the village of Sussex, but, but, but by which he can absolutely control the, the appearance of what it is. Yeah, and that's clearly very important in the 1940s, 1930s, and 40s in that in that media. And I just wonder whether actually whether we know anything about uh, whether whether there are any authors who who, who have misgivings to agree about actually have, what readers can do to their text. Well, that reminds me, and it's a very interesting thing, it reminds me of um, the story about uh, Douglas Adams writing one of his novels. Um, it was the early Macintosh days. Uh, he wrote it, and then he ended up typesetting it as well, partly because he kind of blew his deadlines. <laughs> and he said, I, don't worry, I'll do the typesetting as well, I'll do the layout, and uh, he apparently started rewriting some of it because of the way word uh, sort of page breaks were happening. And he actually started writing the content to fit the layout. Sounds like you. <laughs> Sometimes like me, yes. Um, so I think that's very interesting. Now we've got um, sort of the standard EPUB things for uh, books, where eBooks, where you can change the font, you can change the size, and that will look, of course, a force of reflow. Uh, there is also the fixed layout option, which is becoming more possible and more practical. Um, now, I think it would be pointless to do a fixed layout where you are presenting what is effectively, say, a novel-style uh, type of content. It's a flow of text. And really, you want people to actually just get absorbed. You choose an appropriate font, but they may override it. But it's really, you want them to just go into the information, get lost in it, and just be reading for the, the meaning rather than um, having this sort of, like, okay, this is here, and I've got something parallel here, but if I increase the size, then the parallel sort of lineup is lost. So you need to think what sort of thing you're producing. Is it, uh, a, as Fred said, something may maybe a bit more magazine style, or, um, uh, oh, the word escapes me, but uh, sort of the Dawning Kindersley style, illustrated nonfiction approach. Um, we'll take one more question. Then. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, the, there's been some um, typefaces developed for children's books that actually look like the teacher's handwriting. Mm. Do you think those are necessary? Um, the, well, <laughs> let's hope the teacher's got good handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they are, I don't know about necessary because that is a kind of an absolute, uh, but I think they can be useful. Uh, it can be useful to show uh, children the letter shapes that we're asking them to create. So if we always show them Times Roman and we're saying now draw an A and it's going to be that kind of an A, there's a kind of a dissonance there. Uh, I've done one font which is uh, sort of swings slightly towards that. Uh, I called it Primary Sand. Um, it's online somewhere. That's a free font. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting, but I think some of the fonts that have been done are not very good as fonts because they should work well as a piece of text, as a piece of typesetting text. I think perhaps children should also be able to recognise when they then see, uh, you know, the other kind of A that yes. today. Yes. They need to be able to connect the two things. Between. Yes, and that's I could open up a whole can of worms by saying, well, maybe they need to remember the, the uh, different sounds that they make. It's not always ah. So. There's a 
that's another another <laughs> area of to conversation. Great, thank you. Very okay. Much. Yep. Next up is Jo Hodges. Uh, she's the course director of the BA Honors Advertising at, um, Program at London College of Communication, and she's completing a PhD <laughs> investigating the intersection of textual and visual conception. Yeah. Right. For the yeah, I'm just going to have a, I'm going to have a slightly bigger. Than that. Is that okay? Can I put it bigger? Feel free yeah. to get How do I do that? Let me do that easily. And do it like this. Great. Cool. And then, uh, Hello. Hi. I've got props. I hope um, it's a bottle of water. I hope it works. Anyway, um, I work in advertising. I apologise for that. I know lots of people think it's very, very evil. Um, uh, but, you know, it's also a necessity. And um, a lot of us are very left wing. A lot of us are very right wing. It's a very, very broad church advertising. OK, but we're here to talk about the future of text. OK, so. Okay, so the words you've probably heard of are USP, and you probably haven't heard of ESP. I don't mean extra sensory perception. USP is the old-fashioned word for um, unique selling point. Okay, if you keep that in your head. ESP is emotional selling point. Okay, so the big thing which I want to talk about is um, how technology has transferred or made advertising think about products and talk about things in a different way. What's this got to do with the future of text? Well, in the past... Um, traditional advertising is very, very word-led. And my big idea is, because of technology and the digital revolution, this has had to change. Okay, from USP to back to ESP again. Okay, basically, the essential battle is, it's very rough. I mean, obviously, there are blurs and there are overlaps, but it's text versus image. And um, advertising people, you'd be surprised to know, are wanting to get the affection of the public. They want essentially, you and me to love the product or love them. Okay, so what is the most effective? Is it text or is it image? All right, okay, so how do we speak to the consumer in the age of digital revolution? So how does it relate to books? Well, obviously, how do we get people to read ads? Are, are words the best way to talk to people in this moment that we are in digital revolution? Or is it image or is it a combination of both? Well, I'm a college lecturer, course director in advertising, and my research is looking into how imagery feeds the textual and how text also feeds imagery, but at different stages. Why do I think that? Okay, on a research of one, myself, when I was an art director originally in advertising, I worked with a copywriter who was a very clever person. She gave me yards and yards of words, and it was about selling cough stuff or um, some kind of, any, whatever it is. And I was supposed to do... Um, um, a storyboard out of this and it said something like today it, the, the words came out it's a sunny day this person's got a headache and they go around to the shop and think like, how the hell is this going <laughs> to translate so I thought I'd do some pictures and I wrote it myself and then suddenly thought wow I never considered myself a writer I've always loved words but I always felt trapped inside my body wanted to get to words and actually doing the picture seemed to work and suddenly that was a gateway to words Okay, later on, okay, I became a, a screenwriter. That's obviously a very visual way to write. But then started directing as well. And then the other side happened, that um, whenever I became, uh, became a kind of brick wall for, say, like, pictures, I'd start to write again. And then it was kind of like... So I kind of... Um, the, the thing I'm thinking about, my big idea is it's some kind of thirst. Okay? This... To me, this has a big um, implication for the future of text because of thirst, that if um, it kind of drives you, it, you uh, I'm, going, I'm losing my thread. I'll go back to my script. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's a terrible thing because the first part of this presentation is anti-script and anti-words, but then I come out to love words again. And I think it's kind of inevitable. All right, so let's go back. Cold lecture. So basically... Um, why did I start this? Okay, remembering back of my experience being an art director, then uh, became, fell in love with words, and then had to, um, uh, yeah, I'm a person who loves images, and I've fallen in love with words, and I've come back again, and I've gone back again, is that um, the reason I started doing this, is because at college, I'm in an art school, students have to write a 10,000 word dissertation. Now, a lot of students um, are no good at writing, and they're reluctant essay writers at best. 
So, based on my experience, and then I started to do research and wanted to do a PhD and things like that, and I thought, hey, cool, I'll look into how imagery helps people write. I'll use this as, a, uh, I'll use my students as um, guinea pigs. And that's what I did. So I gave them, um, uh, so at the beginning of writing essays, I thought, well, write, uh, pictures really helped me become a writer. So at the beginning of essay lessons, for example, they have contextual theoretical studies, which really trips off the tongue. But anyway, um, they had to do a picture of what they were talking about. At the end of that session, they had to do a visual. Okay. And it seemed to work. And some of my FDA students who aren't the, the uh, degree students started to compete with the degree students. And actually, because of this engagement, because they actually did a picture of what they were talking about, uh, what they had to then write an essay about seemed to bring them up to kind of like an equal level. So that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. Okay, so then I started doing this research, met Froda and Mike and all these people, and, and you know, it's changed a bit now because I was reminded actually later words and it's typography, um, typography especially being a very beautiful thing, and words, I think um, throughout my travels and uh, when I say research, I mean research of my students and myself, it's going to get bigger. Um, is that actually the, the act of um, words at a different stage deepens people's meaning and satisfaction. And I think, basically, my idea is that um, we're at the, the present stage of um, digital revolution is that it's shiny, it's gimmicky, it's new, it's fantastic. Uh, the, this lady mentioned that um, young people are enamoured with it and it's <coughs> a way to engage. But this is a stage we're at at the minute, yeah? And that eventually, that, that you know, people are going to get a bit sick and tired of it. I'm already sick and tired of click and drag. I like it, but now I'm considering myself a, cl a clever person. I want to know how to write the programs, not just simply present me with the stuff which is very simple to do. That's a problem for Apple in the future, I reckon. It's because if everything's so simplified, it's going to be considered like you know less worthy. And in advertising, if I can tell you about my students, for example. They really, because they've done, they're in the click and drag world, they've got this thirst for knowledge and difficulty. Uh, advertising doesn't do it. We uh, um, talk about Getty images and, um, you know, we make everything easy for people. That's a mistake. The digital revolution... <laughs> Sorry. It's, Sorry. A, it's a massive mistake. It's disgusting. It's stupid. I like crosswords, yeah? But, you know, why do I like cryptic crosswords better than the other stuff? You know, I could, you know, the point, the point is about advertising, they think that everything should be done like quick crosswords. It's ridiculous. You know, the cryptic and the more difficult and the more pain we add into something, it means that you're going to fall in love with that product or person. Anyhow, basically, if you play easy to get, you kind of get pushed to one side. And the same applies in advertising. That's not looked in at all. So um, I did have bottled water. I didn't really explain that. USP. Well, there's no USP. It's water, water, water. So, okay, it's imagery. So because of uh, technology and everything else like that, how do you talk about bottled water? In the past, you know, you could say like, oh, well, it's, um, uh, it's clean. It's from a spring. It's spring water or something. It's very interesting. Nobody cares, really. Uh, and uh, this great guy called Paul Feldwick and other people, and also technology has revealed that actually we don't think about things anyway. And all these fantastic, cool, clever headlines that people did in advertising, um, uh, um, refreshes the parts of the beers can't reach, etc., etc. It wasn't the words which were selling the products, it's the associations. Uh, to Nick, his brilliant idea, but I've also seen it in my students as well, so I'll talk about that in, in a second. I've got time, yeah? Um, is that... Um, Basically, it's the association imagery. So, if, so he gives PG, chi, um, PG t uh, tips, the chimps ads. Okay. So, if we think about the architecture, and everybody thinks there's a hierarchy and all that malarkey about how way people think, I don't even believe that. Is that um, advertising says that you do research first? Yeah. The clever people go out and do the research. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually word-led, they get qu uh, questionnaires and focus groups all through words, and then they boil it down to, here's um, an arena that we <coughs> should advertise this water by. Okay, more words, and they take a slogan or an end line to the, um, uh, to the creative team and say, you must talk about the water in this way. And then what happens is that the creative team do a creative leap. Okay, that creative leap. Okay, did that lead to that? But what happened with PG Tips? That happened like that. that did. This, they said they did all this research and they said, oh, it's all about it's the most um, uh, refreshing tea. 
And then what happened was um, the creative team thought, well, that's really boring. God, you know, what are we going to make out of this? And so I think the guy went, uh, accidentally went, took his kids to Twy Cross Zoo and the chimps were having a teapot. He thought, hey, <laughs> that's cool. So basically what happened was that, you know, um, People love PG tips, not because of the positioning and all this fantastically, really clever research. It's because of the associations of chimps having a great time. <laughs> okay. So, that has massive implications. So, here we are. The so, that's it. Um, uh, very God, this is cheap. I'm, I'm lightning to the present day of digital revolution of chimps having a great time. Okay, here we are. They're having a great time, and the students think this, and this amount of control and interactivity, they love it, and it's great. But then something else is happening with my students. They're doing that, but somehow this thirst, like I said, they're getting this thirst, and um, if it's all visual, if it's all chimp playing time, then most students want to become, I was speaking to my um, Miss, would want to become film directors. Well, um, that's... Great, it's fantastic. I would love to become a film director, but my students don't. We have as many students, if not more, wanting to do advertising. We have to compete with other colleges, and we're getting droves. You know, advertising lost its cool way in the 90s, but it's back. And I think it's because of digital revolution, the combination of visual and text. And um, there's a very, very big point in that. I've completely lost it. Sorry. Let me go to the end. Um, <coughs> I'm glad to say I didn't keep to my script. Um, okay, yeah, so the future of text, this thirst idea. Um, yeah, because of the thirst, I've got students now who want to learn the craft of copywriting and writing, reading and writing. They absolutely love it. Uh, we've got, a, um, in the first year, the advertising agencies, they have to form their own advertising agencies. We've got one who are calling themselves uncle, they go around in slippers and brown cardigans and smoke pipes, not really, but you know. <laughs> and uh, they're all about writing and traditional craft. That's completely opposite to technology. <coughs> and a lot of them are like that. So I don't know whether that means that, but I think that um, uh, writing is going to become extremely important again because of the trend. That's it. Thank Going back to the typography as well. So whenever I do like a little invite for just my little party at my house, I am obsessed with getting the right typography. And I think it's really difficult because you're designing, it's a marketing, tying in kind of the advertising thing, but you need to, you're using the type to convey. But what if you have like duplicitous <laughs> things you want to say? So opposing points and you can't get the right, you know, for different audiences or you know, even with our exhibitions and stuff, so you have different ages, and, you know, how do you, you convey that through this typography and through advertisement and get that just in the one image? And um, well, how do I get the... Well, um, well, okay, let me give you an example. I don't think, this is my opinion, there are, there are two schools of thought, you know, we've got two ways to for our students. One is to get a job now, one is to get a job for the future. The one to get the job now says, well, okay, do appropriate advertising. Here's the appropriate, you know, you talk about, you know, emotional strategies. Let's, let's, it, it makes you feel happy it make, and it gives you well-being, yeah? Okay, so um, that's that. But I think that's very dull and we think that's the way it should be. But then, so a, a, a more interesting exercise is that I ask the students, what can't it be? Okay, and so then they then say, well, you know, things like, well, what about what if it's porn? What about if it's hedonism and stuff like that? So they get something very much more exciting. We had some really cool advertising where, uh, like Jack Daniels, instead of like you know rock stars <coughs> drunk outside clubs drinking Jack Daniels, they're drinking <coughs> water. Okay, now you know the client thinks, well, that's inappropriate. Well, it isn't because it's going to stick in people's memories way more than you associate it with well-being. So just getting, I think, just getting what's right. Is probably very wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I liked it earlier, the whole using images to get you going to get writing and vice versa in the yeah. classes. I just want to thank you for highlighting that reading and knowledge work doesn't happen at a click out there. It really has to be difficult because we yes. don't expand the effort in your head. Yes. You're not learning. And yes, even though I own every single Apple product under the sun, 
they are falling in that trap, they are going down the long stuff. That's, that's, a, that's a massive mistake, and um, I don't know the beginnings of it, but I'm actually getting the thirst that I want to know it. And if things are presented too easily, it's a problem. And advertising is like that. You think, oh, it's too big, they can't be bothered. I think they can be bothered. Already interactivity is making things a bit difficult. You have to search with this, that, and the other. And um, people are just going on holidays, the choices they make. Difficulty is love. Um, you know, if you have a one-night stand, you don't particularly love that person particularly, but if they make it work hard, the same is, like the same for learning. I talked to this to my students, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried it out on you, but they, they listen, and then they, then they like, do that. And I said, well, it's not a question of putting a, a pretty picture in front of somebody. How do you, don't give them that pretty picture, make them work hard for it, and they remember it. I remember the stuff I had to work for, and I love it so much more. You know, I've got round, and I've got by to this day by not reading enough, but now I'm forced to uh, read more because I'm a research student, and I love it. I'm so happy. It's an achievement, and uh, I think maybe... Okay, so the teaching process, it's the pain they go through, but the achievement and the happiness levels and esteem levels will go up, and I think that will happen. People get sick and tired of the throwaway... Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next up is Michael Nutley, the former news media age editor in chief and PSD business journalist specializing in interactive media. I'm going to put your uh, name up there. Yes. And lights. Yeah. Yes. yes. Hi everyone, yeah, so uh, my name is Michael Nutley. Um, it's great to follow, uh, to follow Joe who works in advertising because I can stand up and say I'm a journalist and I don't sound like a bad person. Um, I, uh, I've been a journalist for um, 25 years, uh, writing about software, telecoms and for the last 12 years, digital media. Um, so. Uh, None of what I'm going to say to you uh, that we're going to talk about now is in any way academically rigorous or uh, based even on uh, being a practitioner. Um, Keith has the advantage over me in that respect. Um, what, it, what I have been doing for the past 12 years is, uh, is talking to people who work in digital media uh, about, about digital media and, and, and kind of recycling their, um, their most profound insights as my own. Um, and that's really what I'm going to do uh, for the next 10 minutes. Um, again, I bring to this kind of three different, three different perspectives. One is uh, I am a writer, a, prof a professional writer, uh, who's made the move from, um, from print to online. Uh, I am a professional observer of digital trends. Um, and I'm also a reader. So, so those are the three kind of elements of this that, I, that, I, uh, that I, I, I'm kind of looking at this from. And, and really, I don't have a closely worked argument. Um, what I have is, is, a, is a, a, se a selection of kind of observations and, and questions that, that, that seemed pertinent when I was writing this last night. Um, but when I, uh, listening to the, to the other speakers and thinking about what I'm going to talk about, I think the thing that I'm really talking about is control um, and the, the kind of the, the, the fact that the the one thing, the one overriding thing that uh, the digital revolution has done has moved control of me the media experience from the producer to the consumer. Uh, and the fact that, that, that um, this, is, this kind of profound shift is something that we really, we really still don't know what it means. Um, but there is no sense uh, in which this is going to change. Uh, Rory Sutherland of, 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 of Ogilvy, uh, who is probably the funniest man uh, who you could ever wish to hear speak. And don't ever follow him on a conference platform, by the way, just as a tip. Um, has this, has this, this, this gag that, um, that, that um, interactivity isn't a trend, in the sense that um, wearing flared trousers is a trend. People wear flared trousers, then they stop, then they wear them again. Um, interactive media is not like that. Nobody says... You know what? I really, really like that 56k dial-up stuff. That was great. I think I'm going to go back to that. So you know, it's all kind of going in. It's all kind of only going in one direction. 
and, and, the, and this sense that control has passed from producers to consumers is, is the kind of corollary of that. It's the kind of the unexpected, um, the unexpected payoff from the digital revolution. Um, and it seemed worth talking briefly about what we mean when we talk about interactivity because I think there's an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of different flavours of interactivity that are worth bearing in mind when we talk about what interactivity means in reading. Um, you know, does it mean simply more choice? You know, that's what the red button meant. Um, that's what the red button. That's what red button interactivity meant uh, when you pressed the red button on your TV. Um, you know, ten years ago, actually, all it meant was more choice, more choice of content that you could access. Uh, do we mean the ability to make cosmetic changes, as the kind that you know we were, that Keith was talking about? You know, changing the changing you know the colour of something or the size of something for, for for kind of utilitarian reasons to be able to read it better. Um, do we mean the ability to kind of make material changes, um, to, to, to actually take something and, 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 and alter it for our own purposes, for either utilitarian or aesthetic reasons? Um, or do we mean the, the ability of the work, the thing that we're interacting with, to respond to our intentions? I once met a guy, this isn't quite, quite as you know, bizarre as it sounds, I met a guy um, a while back who worked in Imagineering at Disney. And, um, and his job was to, was to come up with fairground rides, and, uh, theme park rides. And he, he told me of a plan that they were working on to make roller coasters more responsive. So you would sit on the roller coaster in a Disney park and you would grip the bar at the front and there would be sensors in the bar that would, t would be able to tell how tightly you were gripping it and, how, and the temperature of the palms of your hands. And, it would then, and the roller coaster would then... Uh, would then take that information and use it to make the ride either more or less scary, more or less <laughs> rattly, depending on how, on how you felt about it at the time. Um, and they, I, I think they did a prototype of that. I don't ever think they ever put it into practice, but they developed a prototype that allowed them to do this. Or there's something like the game Heavy Rain that was, there was a lot of talk about um, a, a couple of years ago, a game that, that you know, changed every time you played it. So is this what we mean by interactivity? And all those flavours of interactivity, all those kind of, all those kind of different kind of meanings are all, are all sort of, you, you can see um, how each of them might be, uh, might be implied in, in, in the kind of the rethinking of reading that we're talking about. Interestingly enough, Frodo and I sat on a, on a panel at the Stoke Newington Literary Festival, extremely glamorous and worthwhile Stoke Newington Literary Festival, uh, which happens in, uh, in June, um, about the future of the book. And, and one of the things that, um, that we had a couple of authors on the, on the, on the panel with us, and, um, and one of them said that, that in his mind, we, you know, books are things that we interact with, with more than almost anything else already, because we take the raw material that the author has provided us with, uh, and then we build, a, we build a new world in our heads, use it, supplementing that information that we've been provided with. And which is, a, which is in itself a deeply profound interaction, and one that you know, we know that we do, because when we go and see the film of the book, we go, yeah, but yeah, the, that's not what Ahab looks like. He's taller and he's got a different beard. Um, he doesn't look like Gregory Peck. Um, so so that's, that's, you know, I think it's worth, it's, it's worth examining those different kinds of interactivity. Um, I think it's also, you know, it's also the, other, the other thing that's worth thinking about is, is whether there are areas that we can look at and say, okay, what's happened, what's happened in other cultural areas? And, and there are three kind of lessons from the music industry, from music that I think are worth thinking about. The first is the idea of, of, of remix culture. And this came up, again, on the, the panel that Fred and I were on. Um, Jeremy Avil, the, uh, the fantasy writer, uh, was talking about remix culture. And he said he couldn't wait for people to start remixing his books. He thought it was a, this was a great idea, uh, and that you know you'd, you'd buy, you'd buy, you might buy the um, the John Le Carre remix of of, of a book uh, because that would that would heighten the the suspense and the paranoia. Or you might you, know, you might hi you might read the um, you know the, the the Lee Child remix because that would heighten the kind of the violence. You know? <laughs> um, and then. Freud started to talk about some of the ways that you could, um, that you could actually do that within books and you, how you could in, introduce new elements into, in, through e-readers. And he got really, really upset about it. 
And he got really, no, they're my books. I put the, the things in that I think should be there. Everything is in that book for a reason, to achieve an effect, and I'm in charge of that. So why are musicians happy with remixes and, and writers aren't? What is it that's so different about creating music that, that, that you know, that, you know, the, even the most self-consciously arty people in that world, like you know, the Radiohead, for example, are happy to have their work remixed, encourage people to remix it, in a way that writers seem not to be. You know, the, the remix stuff that we have at the moment is kind of is you know stuff like Jane Eyre laid bare and Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. You know, it's all very it's all very self-conscious and it's all it's all you know it, it's not. One of the interesting things about remixing is that it comes from a utilitarian perspective. When DJ Cool Herc was buying two copies of the Incredible Bongo Band records in the 70s in Brooklyn and playing them and playing them back to back, the reason was that he wanted to be able to keep the record going longer than the duration of a disc, because he wanted people to dance for longer to the same record. Um, you know, remixing is actually all about making records, at its core, is all about making records better to dance to. So there's a utilitarian reason there for it. And, you know, I don't think we've discovered a kind of utilitarian reason for remixing books. You know, you might say that, you know, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies or Jane Eyre Laid Bare is, you know, is just a way of, is a way of selling more books. And that's yeah, pretty utilitarian. But we don't have, you know, we don't have a, a consumer's reason for it, a consumable utilitarian reason. And the other thing is, you know, that... Not everybody should be allowed to remix stuff. You know, that's, it turns out that not everybody's good at it. Um, and I think, you know, I think, again, there is that, you know, the, 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 that, that kind of needs to shake itself, shake itself out. I think the second interesting lesson from music is about the availability of everything. Simon Reynolds is very good on this. Um, you know, when I started buying records... You kind of knew certain stuff, you know, some stuff was, was out of catalogue and hard to get and you grubbed around in, um, in record shops to find it. Still do if you like jazz. Um, but, if, but now everything's available. You know, there is, there is this, the, 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 the period over which the works have been created has kind of been conflated into an eternal now where the birds or the beetles are just as contemporary, <coughs> just as available as Jesse Jo. And that has, that has, that's done kind of interesting things to the way people perceive, perceive music. It's, it's kind of conflated generations, but it's also conflated the experience, and it sort of suggests that everything exists together. And the idea of, the idea of influence becomes, becomes harder to, to place. And you know, this is, you know, as, as, you know, as everything, every book becomes available, you know, what effect does that have on how we see literary traditions and, and how we see you know, influ uh, influence? Um, and then the other thing is this, it, you know, from that is, is again, is, 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 is sheer quantity, is the kind of the paralysis of choice that's available. You know, when you have every book that's ever been written available to you as a potential reader, what are you going to read? How are you going to make the choice? You know, do you want, do you want, uh, do you want a, a shuffle function on your Kindle? For, for the morning when you're sitting on the bus and you can't decide which book you want to read and it pops up, you know, it pops up the first chapter of Moby Dick or it pops up the first chapter of, you know, or, or, of whatever. You know, it, you know, how do you make those choices? What are, particularly as the metadata is stripped out. This is the other thing that, the, the, that's, happened, you know, that's, that's happened profoundly to music. And, you know, and, and you know, as you, as you, as, uh, is to take away all the stuff that says that says this is what this music is about and just present you with this is this music. Here is, here is a song by the birds. You know, was it recorded, you know, was it recorded you know, last year or was it recorded 30 years ago? Because actually there are bands that sound exactly like that recording that music right now. And does that matter? And why, you know, if it do, you know, um, and why has all that data been stripped out of the system? There are attempts to put it back in, but they're, they're, they're not terribly... They're not they've not been terribly successful, and why? Why is that? So, you know, I think those are three are three interesting kind of things to think about. The other thing that I think is worth talking about very briefly. Have I got, have I got time to talk? A couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. So, there's two things I've just mentioned them very quickly. One is 
What effect does social media have? I mean, one of the, thing, one of the effects that social media does have is that it starts to replace, it starts to offer a way of, of curating and filtering um, content. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of people who are working on, on, um, on curation uh, as a... As a and curation has become the buzzword uh, um, around content, you know, for, for a while now. Um, I still don't see anybody actually paying for curation, which is another interesting point, particularly when you're a, mag <laughs> when you're a magazine editor. Um, but what's happened is that, that, that social media has enabled us to put in to put a, a mechanism for curation around what about around ourselves you know our friends recommend stuff to us all the time it's a non-stop our friends our friends the, our friends friends you know social media is is you know at times almost nothing but a massive set of recommendations to go and read this listen to this watch this so so you know part of that at least part of that um that role for understanding what you might read next comes comes that that, that role is being performed not by not by publishers, not by traditional structures anymore, but more and more by by our by our social circle. Um, the other thing I'm involved a startup I'm involved with at the moment is is kind of looking to dig into that even further and is starting to look at the idea of crowdsourcing books. These would be these would be digital marketing textbooks, yeah. But the but and, and, and you can kind of see how that would work. But one of the other alternatives is that, you know, going back to this idea of the, of the metadata being stripped away from the thing, is an idea that you might, you might be able to, ha you, you, you would you buy a book and all the commentary about it would come with it if you wanted to read it. If you, uh, you know, you, you know uh, it's quite common for people writing books to blog about the book and to use the, their blog as a way of, as a way of talking, uh, as a way of refining their ideas. You know, and it's reasonably common for those um, for those books to, to, for those authors to then go on and blog about their books and to continue uh, to continue a fairly desultory discussion um, about what they've done, um, mainly because they, there's no money to be made there, and they actually they're going on and they're writing their next book. But if you could, you know, if, if part of what you got as with your with your copy of um, you know of Moby Dick when you bought it from um, from, from Amazon on Kindle was, you know, all the discussion around that book. Then you've got then then that's again that's quite a profound that's quite a profound change and quite a you know a, a reintroduction of of this kind of metadata in into the into the world of reading. Um, conclusion: there are none. There are no conclusions. Um, we're on the verge of of a number of dramatic um, technological changes around around um, around actually the actual physical products on which things can be read. Um, we're also, as any reader of Ray Kurzweil will know, um, at a time when technological innovation is speeding up. Kurzweil's argument is that you know every innov the, the, the innovation curve is. Um, <coughs> is not a is not doesn't go like that. It goes like that, and the word for going like that's gone completely out of my head. Um, exponential. That's what I'm looking for. Um, as every every innovation doesn't just make one more innovation possible or two. It makes tens, hundreds. Um, so you know, technological change is, is there is no sign, there is no sense in which this is going to stop. Um, there is, you know, there. There is just a sort of a point in we are at, as Joe so 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 eloquently put it. Yeah, you know, we are just at a point where we can talk about where we are now, and we can look, we can make predictions. But the um, you know, the uh, I'll leave with I'll sort of finish with two ideas. One is the idea that you know we always we always overestimate the short term impact of technology and underestimate the long term, and that the 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 other is a, is a is an idea from William Gibson which is that people really only start to do interesting stuff with technology when it's merged into the wallpaper, when it's become, you know, it's become commonplace, where it's part of the plumbing. And you know, with so much of this technology, we're, we're not even at, the sta at that stage. Thank you. Sort of degrees of resistance to remix culture amongst different genres. 
I just wonder whether actually there is um, uh, the parallel is better between uh, the, the serious novelist and, and the classical composer. In that actually there's still uh, I would say that the, the number of the number of creators of contemporary classical music who were open to remixing is is relatively small. And actually they're quite a hit bunch. Because Philip Glass so yeah, yeah. Uh, this week uh, yes. remix album Philip Glass album uh, Philip Glass material just came out. Because I wonder, because I just wonder whether actually the, the, the sense is actually that the, the both both are in, in 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 the business of creating a a complete artifact, as it were, and and, and so if you if you remember the the launch of Classic FM in the early in the early days, one of the one of the the complaints about about Classic FM in relation to Radio Three is that it only played tracks rather than whole movements. And the point was, you know, it's actually not the, the, the one movement from Mahler Symphony isn't meaningful without being placed in the context of all the others. And so I wonder whether that some of that explanation is, is the different um, view that most novelists have of their of their task than Radiohead. No, I think that's I think that's um, I think that's uh, I think that's a very valid point. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I think it's it, what's interesting is that, that there have been novelists who have effectively remixed their own work. Um, you know, the, the example that sprang to mind was Scott Fitzgerald, uh, who, who famously kind of restructured the whole of Tender Is the Night. Although Scott Fitzgerald had some very odd ideas about things, um, uh, but yeah, he, the, the two the, the two different versions of, of, of Tender and the experience you get from them is is very very different. Um, I suspect I suspect you know what what you what the, this the, the idea of, of of classical. Yes, I uh, I agree, but I think there is more and more interest of, of contemporary classical composers in being remixed, and uh, then uh, and and I suspect that will be that will continue to be more and more of a factor. Yeah, you know, Steve Reich and Philip Glass being only being kind of the most obvious examples. It seems that maybe television is in the middle here because the new Sherlock is fantastic and people like it and accept it. It's a wholly remixed. It's not the old buddy buddy Sherlock. It's a new Sherlock. It's a remix. It's, I think that's a very interesting trend. I mean, I hope it's a trend, not just a one. The new American Sherlock. Well, that's not talk. Okay. <laughs> but what, have, I, have, I got, have I got a second? Uh, uh, do, you, do you guys know Scary Mary? Have you seen Scary Mary on YouTube? Can I, have I, got, have I got a second to just call up a YouTube sure thing? Because I think there's a different. The, the, this is the, 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 there's a reason I'm, I, I mentioned this. You know, there is a, a difference I think between between a kind of an um, an authorized um, remix and a kind of a, an unauthorized remix. Um, <coughs> any of this? That one. Well, this is this is yeah. This is exactly what I wanted to show you. So yeah, this is yeah done six years ago. But this is this is kind of this is go, this is what I was talking about with control. There is there is the kind of the authorized remixing of stuff, which is which is you know which is you know Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, and then there's that, and that you can't put a lid on. That's just that's just going to happen, and and you know the. Uh, yeah, it, the genie is out of the bottle, and, and the more and, and as things get as things get digitized, yeah, yeah. It, I wanted to show that because you know there's this yeah the, the music. One of the things that enables music to be remixed is is the kind of digitization of it. it makes it incredibly easy to do. That's what's yeah. You know, that's yeah. You know, it would be interesting to know whether those guys you know. I, I suspect they just they, they that's all digital. Um, 
you know, as soon as stuff moves into the digital realm, unauthorized remixing just happens. And, and that's, I mean, that's what advertisers want now. They're desperate for that to happen. I don't know how many meetings I've been in, but that's one of the yeah. conditions of the brief. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Sorry. Um, this might be two questions rather than one, picking up on two ideas that you've uh, that you mentioned. You've just talked about unauthorized remixes. Um, how, is that, how does that sit in relation to copyright? Second, the long-term vision of the digital culture. How does that sit in relation to the proprietary aspect of a lot of social media. If Facebook pulls the plug on its computers tonight, it's gone. Yeah. And all the years that all of us have invested in curating our own lives, it's, it's gone. We don't have, have access to it anymore. If we already have access to it now, it's, it's a question of whether that content is ours or Facebook. Yeah. And there's, there's, yeah, and there's, a, big, there's a big question about, about wall gardens <coughs> in this and whether wall gardens can, can persist and survive. Um, uh, <coughs> copyright, I think, is you know, is you know, that horse, that horse is gone. Yeah, the the you know, you can pursue this stuff, um, you can pursue this stuff as as rigorously as you like. But you know, as as, as Russ just said, actually, you know, you're probably better off letting that letting letting Scary Mary out, knowing that it'll encourage people to go back to Mary Poppins. I interviewed actually one thought, and then I'll I'll, I'll stop. I interviewed uh, David Putnam a little while a little while ago, and we talked about we, we talked about about piracy. And he said he said he said something a really interesting thing, which <coughs> that was that he, you know he he still gets checks for uh, for the movies that he made when he was at Columbia before, and the surprising thing to him is that those checks get bigger every year rather than smaller. He expected that he would gradually he would the, the money that he got from Chariots of Fire or you know or Midnight Express would sort of just peter out and it's going in the opposite direction and his his conclusion was that pirated copies are of of those films are encouraging people to go out and buy them and that and that he now sees he now sees piracy as a co as a marketing cost he sees it as a as a as a way of making a market one more really quick one and then we As uh, a person who writes outside of my internship here sometimes, do you, you think that the kind of, I wouldn't call it about, but that kind of the crossover between things going on print to things moving more online, do you think it's going to continue at this rate in the next probably two to five years, or do you think that at some point it may be that it will be, that there will be kind of like print will be more of a niche for some people, but online will be more of the preferred method? Like, uh, uh, online will undoubtedly be the preferred method. Um, I think, uh, um, and it's, I think it was something that, 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 that Roger said that made me think um, about about artifacts. You know, going back to, again, going back to music. You know, one of the things that's one of the things that's really interesting is is you know there is still a really vibrant vinyl culture. People buying black vinyl discs, um, but it's it's only a niche. It's a niche audience. You know, it's entirely possible to see uh, a future in which in which books are are actually owning physical printed things is a is a is a kind of a niche activity, you know. I mean, there's uh, the uh, I go and stay in a in a in a small town in North Norfolk uh, on holidays called Holt. And when I started going there about 15 years ago, they had um, something like a dozen second-hand bookshops. Now there aren't any. And the and there is one there is one bookshop in the town. And it was famous, you know. This was, it was a place that was famous for its second-hand bookshops, mm. and they've gone. So 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 you know, I'm not saying it will happen, but you know certainly if you look at if you look at the if you look at the, the music industry, yeah, there is a vibrant vi vinyl culture, and vinyl sales in, have been increasing, but from you know a tiny base, the and the artifact, yeah, there are people who love the artifact just as there are people who love who love Printed books, but that's not that's not where the I suspect that's not where the mainstream is anymore. Thank you. Ross Phillips is an
interactive designer, practicing artist, and he's worked on projects including Read Aloud at the National Media Museum. Hello. Um, Stella invited me to come and talk because she'd seen my project Read Aloud at the National Media Museum, which is running currently and is running for a year till March. And so I thought I'd start by showing a bit of that, and I've got a video clip from it. And then I've pulled out kind of ten projects that are not done by me, but are, and have been done over the last few years that kind of speak about all of the different themes we've been talking about today, and I just, I just want to run through those. So I'll be quite quick, I think. Um, so this is Read Aloud, um, and it's currently at the National Media Museum. And the idea of this project is to encourage people to read aloud and to read aloud in a collaborative way, in a way that gives them um, kind of a creative space to play in, which is something I like to do in all my work. And the simple concept is you come into the space inside the gallery, you sit down and you're presented with a block of text, which you can see on the screen there, and you're invited to press a button, which is in front of you and then read that text aloud you're then recorded and it's played back and so you can decide if you like it or not and then that's then uploaded to a website and also played back in the gallery on a, on a kind of the wall adjacent to here um, I've been picking up books using the uh, Gutenberg project so out of copyright books I then go through them and pull out chunks of text that I feel are kind of suitable for reading the, the gallery has a real age range from sort of 5 to 70 is their demographic and I was conscious that I didn't want to give people too much to read. Um, I did think I'd just be able to automate it but it turns out um, I, did the, I did Alice in Wonderland for the first book and the way that's constructed it's, it's really complicated the sentence structure so I hand go through it and mark up the text um, which takes a while I've just done Jane Eyre as we'll see. That did take some time but actually it gives me a nice connection to the text and it's, um, it's worked out well. So um, we've done uh, we started with Alice in Wonderland, that got read in a couple of weeks. We then moved on to The Raven, Edgar Allan Poe, that didn't take long. Um, I then did Hound of the Baskervilles, which has been completed. I then did some Edward Lear nonsense poems, and now we're on Jane Eyre, which I think is going to run to the end because it's, yeah, it's broken up into about 11,000 lines. It took me a long time. Um, so... This is running at present, we're on chapter seven, so I've made, I've not edited this, I've basically pulled out a chunk that was recorded this Wednesday, and you, I mean, you'll see how it plays, so let me just, it's about two minutes, so. Chapter seven. <laughs> the fear of failure in these pipes harassed me. Words of the physical hatchet of my, of my lot, though these were not trapped. Oh my God, you have and it's, I should say, it's not edited, so you do get people mucking around, and you know, it's part of the charm. Today, our top story is a man with a gun and bullets taking on the city of Manchester. This is brilliant. 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 This is I'm out of there. All humble times in the cemetery of your place as Rocky, and in the love of the shrouds in your station, I endure from this cause every evening when my feet in play. And the torch of rusting and swelled its roar and stiff toes with my shoes in the morning. Then the scanty supply of food is distressing, and the keen appetites of grown children, we have scarcely sufficient to provide a delicate invalid. She sort of zones out. Many a time I shared between two flavors the fresh animals of the brown bread dish we did at TV. After many effort up on the bottom of my foot of public Two 
Okay, so that's a little clip. So you can... And you can go online at present and you can watch the whole of Alice in Wonderland, the whole of Hand of the Baskervilles, it's all there. And, um, it's readaloud.info. If you Google read aloud, actually, I think it's either hit one or two, which I'm pretty happy about. <laughs> such a, um, but also it tweets, so it tweets the lines out line by line, so you can follow the um, Twitter feed. You can see the line click, and it takes you directly to the video. There's a load of, obviously, metadata built into it when we're capturing the data, so it enables us to show statistics. So we can tell you how much video we've recorded, how many lines, what percentage of the book we're on, how complete it is, how many people have taken part to get to that. Um, and then the plan is, and we haven't, I haven't kind of got to it yet, but the, the data is, is stored in such a way that I'm going to release the API, which basically allows people access to the data, all of it. So the kind of the line linked to the video, linked to the extracted sound file, linked to the, th linked to the thumbnail, with the idea that I'm going to say, a, which what we've been talking about, remix the videos and do a kind of burrows, cut up, do um, a chorus of, of people all saying the same line of repeated some of the books. So you've got the same line being read by the same person. So there could be a nice choral thing to be done with that. And, you know, all of that sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, I guess what I like about it, you get... You're told to read the line and people sit down and they just behave mostly on the whole. They'll sit down so you'll get people who perhaps, you know, it's, it's me judging, but you wouldn't think would sit down and read a bit of Jane Eyre out loud. And they sit, you sit them down, it's a single button and, and there they go and they're away and they're really enjoying it because you're, you're giving them a kind of a, just this creative space where they feel comfortable and, and, and they can do it and they can perform. They're still reading the line mostly, but they're kind of doing all of this additional stuff and I think what's well, been running since March I've pulled out maybe fifth, 10 15 videos and I mean there's you know hundreds and thousands of videos and I've pulled those out because they were racist essentially that's those have been the only ones but otherwise it's completely unedited and kind of left as is so that's read aloud and yeah you can go and look at it online um, so then I've pulled out 10 projects that just thinking about it, I just wanted to kind of talk about. So this is a game called Dear Esther, which was re-released uh, this year in a kind of updated format. And the idea, you control it with a mouse and a keyboard, and the interaction is you simply walk about a landscape, and you find these documents, which you can see on the screen, which are then read out, and it's triggered by your location in the landscape. So by exploring the landscape, which is a kind of fictional Outer Hebrides island and you're always kind of aiming for this um, lighthouse, there's always this glowing light in the distance you're heading towards, you kind of piece together this fragmented narrative and, and depending on how you walk through you get the pieces of the story in different, in different ways and the story is, um, it's very vague and it's kind of left for you to kind of um, decode but it's a beautiful game and it takes a, a couple of hours to play through and you kind of get your own um, you know, you take what you can from it. But again, there's, there's no clicking, there's no jumping, there's no opening doors, it's just a, it's just a walk. Um, this is by some clever folks at a company called Berg. This is called The Little Printer. And it's a printer that sits in your house and it, it kind of pulls together, aggregates, as we've been talking, your kind of social feeds, as mm -hmm. well as, they call them publications from, let's say, The Guardian are on board and let's say there's cartoonists. So every day you can set it so you could have one a week or one every day or, or twice a day. You get your own personalised printed newspaper, which comes out of this little chap here. Um, and so, th I mean, you can see Foursquare there. It could say on the top that you're meeting friends tonight in the pub, but then you could get, we, I mean, Read Aloud would work on there. You could get the next piece of a story. You could get a cartoon. You could get that day's headlines. But you you've curated it, there's an app online which you use, and then you're, you know, you get this in a physical, tangible form, however, using all of the kind of digital elements we've been talking about today, and it's beautifully designed, and it's a, you know, it's a nice object in itself. Um, this is something called a book sprint, which I'm sure many of you are aware. This is about getting together and producing a book in sort of three to five days. I think there are sort of hard and fast rules, and I'm, not, I'm no expert on it, but the, the basic idea is that you, you get together with some people in a room, you've got nothing, you create a book, you type it, you um, collaborate crucially, and I, I think a lot of the 
the, the fun in a book sprint is that initial, is that collaboration, but the idea being to use technology to get you to a book result at the end, whether it's a, print, a printed book bound using kind of quick print on demand methods or whether it's a PDF that people can then access within the five days of you kind of putting it together, um, which is brilliant. This is from a company called Visual Editions, which I, I like. They do kind of very elaborate printed versions of books. Um, and this is one of them, a reimagining of a book by Mark Supporter, which is a box which comes with the book and the books on individual pages. And you're encouraged, I guess, a bit like Dear Esther, to just pick up and read whichever page you want. And again, take the meaning through this um, non-linear way of reading, which struck me as quite a digital way of, of operating, but obviously in this sort of physical environment. And then, obviously, they released an iPad app, um, which essentially does the same thing. Um, but I think, you know, it's probably, you can't beat that. But, you know, that's just me. Um, this is a bit duller, but it's, I don't read a lot of books on on digital devices, but I'd, I was in Venice and I'd, I'd left a book and I needed a book and I'd, I had my iPhone, so I decided to read through it's not here, but I read through a lot of Sherlock Holmes, which is free. You can just download it. And because of the language use in Sherlock Holmes, there's a lot of archaic language that I didn't get. And just the ability, the really simple, non-showy ability to have a dictionary definition at your fingertips straight away, for me, feels like the the sort of the killer app for those devices. Forget the, you know, the sort of fairly, I mean, I don't like all of this kind of page turning and pretending to be a book and, and moving things around and interacting um, too much, but that just really utilitarian idea of just being able to look up a word straight away without ha having to go to a reference, I think is just, is brilliant. This is another game um, that came out in August uh, 2011 called The Stanley Parable. And it's a, what's called a modification of another game. So they use the games, the previous game's assets and kind of graphics engine to then create their own story. And what's nice about this is it's a story told through narration. And it sounds a bit, the narration is a bit like a Doug, Douglas Adams, it's a bit hitchhikers, but you're in control with a mouse and a keyboard again and all you can do is walk. But the narration in this case will say, um, Stanley woke up um, early one morning and decided to go and see his boss. He walked through the left door, but you can choose to go through the right door. And then the narration will say, <clears throat> and it'll drop you back and it'll say, Stanley chose to go through the left door. And you can persist and it'll go, Oh, very well then. Stanley went through the right door. But along all of these, so that's just one example. So throughout, there's this branching narrative. And it's funny because it, it feels like you've got control, but actually you haven't. It's, 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 it's all part of a joke. And it feels interactive, but it's, it's not really. You're just kind of, you're forcing this story along. And it's brilliant. And it's free. And it's, it takes about, again, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to play through. And it's very funny and very well produced. A, lo a lovely project. Um, and this, this is not specifically this project, but the idea of um, conductive ink and using conductive ink in books. There was a great project done at the RCA, um, I think 2008, maybe 2007, where the, you, know, you had a physical book, but you would connect circuits just on the page with your fingers, which would then fire off data on a screen next to you. So you could be kind of exploring the book and reading it in a way that didn't feel, you know, you weren't having a screen you know, the screen wasn't intruding on you, but if you did want that extra layer of information, um, you could choose to have it. And this is, this is not, it's becoming more and more popular, and this is a kit by, uh, they're called Bear Conductive. So these are greetings cards, and you can see you pop a couple of LEDs in there, and then you use this pen, which is the conductive ink, to just link them all up. So the ph physical thing is paper, but it, it, it can react in interactive ways, like as if you were using a screen or a computer. And there's a nice music project called The Listening Post, which allowed you to, it was a, a band list for gigs that were coming up and it allowed you to hear the music and what bands were coming on. It was just all built into a poster. Very nice. This is by um, a, a group called Vice Seven. This is a, a book of their show they did in Berlin and the book itself, and I wish I had another picture, but you know, looks like a book, but you open it up and there's a little computer inside. And what happens when you open the book it starts a kind of internet independent, so you don't need to have a wireless connection um, server that you can then browse on your device. So you could be sitting in a boat with your iPhone 
open up the book and then you gain access to all of the material that was shown in the show so images data videos and it, and when you shut the book then that server is it's over it's closed but quite a fun nice idea i think um this is newspaper club which has been running for a, a good few years and again is another brilliant project and similar to um, the little printer in that it's kind of democratizing newspapers they use the off hours in printers um, when they're not being used and so you submit a book online a PDF and you can tell them what your print run is so you can do 10 magazines or you can do 10,000 um, and I might you know those numbers are a bit fuzzy to be fair uh, but you design the book you print it out they've just released different formats they'll staple the thing for you and then deliver it so you can have your own and you know groups do it schools do it I'm sure brands have done kind of versions of it but um yeah super nice using technology but with this kind of physical outcome at the end and then the ultimate physical outcome oh that sounds a bit um i was going to bring it along today but it's too big um but i really wanted to have the thing to show you but this is by chris ware who's a, a graphic novelist and he's just produced this which is a um a box of comics and it just I, when i got it it feels I've, i mean i've collected his work for a long time but it, and his work is always like this but this is 18 books, pamphlets, differently bound um, inside this beautiful box, they're kind of the size of a, a game of Monopoly. And it, it just struck me that you could, well, you can't currently evoke the feelings that I get from looking, rifling through that box and holding it and exploring it on any of our current devices. You can, I mean, you could stick all of that on an iPad, and I've looked at some of his stuff on, a, on an iPad, but to lose that form it loses um, what is so great about, uh, great about his work. So I just wanted to end on that, and I did want to bring it, but um, it's really big, and I thought I'm going on from here, and I didn't want to have the, the thing. Um, so that's it, that's it. It's slightly, it's slightly, is it conflict? Maybe they've released it. But if you do a search for Dear Esther, E S T H E R, and I think it might be a standalone game now. Initially, you had to download the game, it was, yeah, I think it's standalone. It's about six quid, seven quid, but it's well, well worth it. Oh, sorry, what was the, what was the Stanley one called? The Stanley Parable. The Stanley. <coughs> that one might be a bit more convoluted in terms of how you play it, but. Um, Again, worth persevering. So you're curating all different ways that um, writing is uh, curated or made. Yeah, I guess I guess I looked at the questions that Stella um, sent through an email and and yeah. just felt that all of these projects are exploring, you know, those questions. And this is where it is at the moment. Or you know, these are the projects that I'm interested in at the moment. Right. Are you doing an exhibition of all of it? Oh no, I did this. I mean, this is just twelve. Eight, one o'clock in the morning yesterday. <laughs> you know, it's just. Oh, well, do you think it, I think it sounds mm. like, it's like a great exhibition to me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, a lot of this stuff I've, I, I nominate for the d designs of the year at the Design Museum, and a lot of this stuff I've, I've you know, has, has been in various bits and bobs that I've nominated. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it would be amazing. And I mean, this is just scratching the surface. There's loads of stuff that I wanted to put in, but I tried to keep it to, to 10. I think it's really good because uh, what you're doing is look at different forms, and lots of these different to other people because they think, you know, here's a book and this is quite writing it. And this is fantastic. Well, interact with it. Yeah, and I guess my sort of thing is that a lot of the stuff you see on an iPad, I mean, I worked, um, I worked to, I started working in an agency called AMX, which is no longer there now, with a, an amazing graphic designer called Malcolm Garrett. And at, at that time, um, we were doing a lot of CD-ROMs, and I don't see a lot of difference, apart from all of this kind of stuff, between what you see on an iPad now. Dr. Zeus is a great example. It's a CD-ROM, basically. It's just a different device, and people are getting excited because it's the device, not the content. The content looks like anything you've seen over 20 years ago, a, a lot of the time, in general. You know, but then it's the it's the people who are exploiting the devices, the the fact that they're location aware, the fact that an iPad um, as a physical or a Kindle as a physical device you can pass to someone. That's really nice. That's a nice interaction. So why aren't we, you know, doing more like that? I think just translating CD-ROMs is just. Okay. Do you have you? Um, so if um, this digital technology, which I think is a great thing, but it's not a great thing, but it's a great thing. 
And I look at my students' work, it's flattened it out quite a lot. You know, before they'd have a great idea, be really exciting. Now they take 10 pages to get the idea because it's mimicking what's like on the top of a, you know, a computer screen, which is really bad, I think. Yeah. Have you seen any um, digital thing like this which has really truly exploited digital technology in the way you haven't? About would say all of this does. Is that, right, is sorry, that does, okay. But something which is like um, bound on an iPad. Um, what do you mean? Something that's oh, something that's on an iPad yeah. that is really nailing what which is an really iPad like can do. There, yeah. um, oh, that's put me on the spot. Mm -hmm. We um, can give you a bit of time. Perhaps it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, the there, there's got to be <laughs> for sure. There is. <laughs> yeah, but do you know what I was like? It's the utilities that I like on those things. It's not. Well, it's. it's really it's the fact that I'm in a station and I can get access to something cool. or that... No, this, is, this is great, this is bringing it all to life. This is a bit more exciting than the stuff that's going on. There must be something, something somewhere. Okay. Yeah, for sure there is, yeah. Sorry. Thank you Sorry. very much. Yeah. Um, we have one last really quick announcement from our, um, our co-host here today. And then we'll wrap up. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time left, but that's fine. I'm just so... Very, very happy for you guys to be here today. It's, yeah, perfect, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. So I'm going to rush through mine. Mine is very, very simple. I'm going to talk <coughs> about only interactivity. And uh, now you all hopefully have a better understanding of what interactivity is. I certainly have. When uh, Michael and I was on that panel a while back, we talked about interactivity, and people in the audience actually thought we meant calling up the author and talking to him on the phone. <laughs> that, that's real. Right, so here's a very basic thing. Information is important, useful, too much of it, it's difficult to deal with, so we need better ways to deal with the information. I think we need information to be more liquid. That's my philosophical position. See, this is the problem. It was written, you know, we're here in the library, you know, Roger was talking about putting the books up on kind of a pedestal in a way. I think <coughs> all books do that. You know, when you publish something, even if you publish yourself, you look at your own words, it's like, wow, this is not authoritative. I can't question this. It's in a book. People, you know, if they're having an argument with you, they say, where did you read that? If you just heard it, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so we need to get past that, I think. It's very important. We need to get from it was written to it is written. We need to get an understanding that uh, reading is also a nonlinear process. You know, you don't sit down with an empty head and read through a book. Let's really exploit that. Uh, you probably saw this coming in today. Obviously, books should not chain you down. They should lift you up. That's really the main emphasis. Information itself, and I'm not talk necessarily talking about narrative. I'm talking about all kinds of stories, science, all kinds of information. Information is an active thing. It's not cold, boring data. Data originally just meant to give, which is why we get the word um, date. When the Romans handed a document, they put, it was given at this point. So we got that into dates. So date, data, same thing. Etymology, it's really fun to get caught up into etymology, and I think it's very important to do that because words inherently mean nothing. They're connections of other words, and you see how they come together. We get a richer understanding of everything. Uh, text, texture, textile, it's the same root. I think that's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, uh, Keith, with all due respect with typography, whom I love, but not maybe to your obsession, Reading is an active thing. It is what's behind it. And you read with old things, new things. You should be able to keep doing that when you're working. I'm talking about interaction. Interaction with what? I'm talking about interaction with symbols. We talk about text. We talk about images. You know, the earliest cave painting was, you know, spray-painted hands. It's a symbol. I don't know what it means. But symbols are more than just text. People joke maybe about emoticons. Uh, Michael was saying that maybe emoticons is putting us back in the cave. It's yet another expression. We can keep communicating. Why are symbols so important? Because it allows us to get a huge amount of information into our heads. Our working memory is tiny. Obviously, the seven items is discussed in many papers, but I mean, look at all this other stuff we have. We really need to use that. So here's the big idea. Any questions or comments on that? <laughs> There's something unique about numbers and words. They're inherently interactable. If you have two numbers, you put a plus in the middle, the machine can figure that out because it's inherently interactable. There's something similar going on here. Ross was talking about looking up you know, a dictionary definition. Yes, that's because it is inherently interactable. And interactivity, so many things were talked about. I think that interactivity is not just, I mean, some people said with the internet and later with the web, it's like going to the library just quicker. 
which is true, but it's also meaningless. I mean, if you took pictures in a sequence, you do it quickly enough, change the speed, you have an entirely new medium, it's a movie. So to have interactivity built into the work, yes, you could have gone to do something, but the fact that you don't have to means it's an entirely new thing. Any, it's a bit controversial, agreements, disagreements on that one? Good. <laughs> so liquid, which is about where I'm coming from, I think information should be liquid, which is why my, my company is called the Liquid Information Company. It is about motion, it's about activity. Let's look at the state of the art, word processors, email, web browsers, and e-readers. I mean, seriously. Anybody want to argue that any of these guys have done anything fundamentally useful? I mean, have you played a video game lately? Photorealistic, multi, lots of things. I mean, web browsers. 1991, the first web browser. Yes, it was an innovation, but today, what do we have that's different? Name one thing, and then I'll get on, because I know we're all hungry. One innovation in web browsers since 1991 other than getting rid of Flash, which was certainly good. Right, so this is what I'm working on. Um, we currently have a Mac OS X application. We've done server, we've done plugins for web browser and all that stuff. If you're familiar with Command-C or Control-C, everybody familiar with that? Use it every day? Right. You'll be familiar with this. I'm going to give you a very, very brief demo. And I'm going to have to move this. Okay, now that's too difficult. Let me just mirror the screen. It should only take a second so I can see what I'm showing you. And click. Okay. So here we have some text. And like Ross was pointing out, it's nice to be able to just gonna unplug this. To be able to select things anywhere. And this application of ours works on all the apps on the Mac, absolutely everywhere. Uh, you select text, then you do command at, which is command shift 2. You can change that if you prefer something else. And then you get this little bar. It looks like it's part of the Mac. It's designed to be, it's completely not. This is the liquid information software, right? So let's do a very basic thing. References, Wikipedia. Here it is. Very, very simple. I'm going to go back in here. We'll do, what's that? Okay, so now I'm going to do keyboard shortcuts. So I do command at T for translate, and it's Arabic. So what do you think I do now? A. A, exactly. And we want it in English, so well, obviously I've done it recently, so that's why it's kind of a short thing. Well, I'm going to do E. There it is, hello. <laughs> so it's done. If I now command C without selecting it, because the system understands, you wouldn't want to copy original text, right? It's now copied. I can go here and paste it. If I needed to. Similarly with numbers, convert currency from dollars to pounds. And it's there. Final thing to show you, I'm doing maths now. Exciting, huh? Right? It's just another type of interactive. A number is interactive at least as much as text, right? And why do we have to copy calculators? If Oh, no, I didn't mean 500. I meant 50. Change it and automatically updates. That's the demo. Any questions for the demo? Yes? I guess uh, Google does a lot of that. I haven't really framed it as a question. So what's different between that and Google? What's different between that and Google? OK. Is it clicks? Is it speed? A lot of it is exactly that. It's the clicks. And I mean, let's. if I want to have a look at the picture of the British Library, right? I do this. So it's, it is speed. It really is like driving a car rather than, you know, driving a car with your hands rather than telling something like Siri, steer left, left, no, crash, right? It, it, you have to have that. A, a month ago, I started skateboarding, thanks to Keith. Okay, I already have my first injury. And, you know, to be able to do the motions live to go through the information makes it a completely different thing than something as inane as, you know, telling Siri, Siri, can you please look up? Oh, for God's sake, you know, that's going back talking to Grandpa. In most situations, not all situations. I mean, there are just so many other things that can be done, that, which I won't go into. I'll just show convert searching references, translating, and also sharing. Uh, if I wanted to now tweet a, or Facebook this, it's just as quick. <coughs> so because we don't have a lot of time, the slide on the future, all I would like to ask you to do is beg to think about your bodies more. 
because even though this is intellectual, that all this information, I mean, our hands are incredible things. Do you know how many muscles we have in the hand? None. They're all up here. Right? It's just such an intricate thing that we have. And you know when you eat Indian food and you're allowed to eat with your hands, it tastes completely different? Right? We have so much input and output in our hands, in our eyes, in our ears. You know, sounds can be many different things. And even in our noses, we should use this. We should not be stuck with this pathetic little keyboard or pathetic little iPad. I mean, I love both, but we need to get way beyond any of that stuff. So please just keep in mind the book reading information. It's a lot more than what's coded in a little codex. So in closing, some say information wants to be free. I would go further than that. I would say that information is interaction. Because if information is not interactable, it's not information, is it? And when information is free, the result is that we become free. Thank you very much. Any final questions before we all break up and eat and so on? Sorry? Memory? Yeah. In what context? What do you mean? Sometimes when you have new programs. I mean, I've seen something similar to that before, using a web browser. I haven't seen it like in, in the background, but right. this kind of, it behind this kind of time to Oh, the computer memory? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, don't worry about that. On a, on a, okay, here, here's the thing that came up earlier, Moore's Law. Okay, I don't know if everybody's familiar with Moore's Law, but here's the amazing thing about the time we live in. Moore's Law means that computer power per dollar or per pound gets twice as powerful every year and a half. What that really means that in one year and a half in the future for the same money, you will be able to buy the entire history of computing, the fastest you can make, doubled. I mean like the iPad mini that just came out. That's a supercomputer a few years ago. So in terms of these types of utilities and what's possible. Yeah, I mean early things with web browsers you have to remember are programs and programs and programs. They're really horrible structures to try to develop anything. Any normal programming now, all of these utilities, we can go much further without the computer having to break a sweat. Can I uh, also, add, I've, been, I've been using that software for a little while, and uh, yeah, it's, it's negligible. You won't really notice that it's running or it's available. It it's just becomes a natural part of what you start using. Any other questions? Thank you very, very much. Great. Thank you.